Hello, everybody. Welcome to the first session of our three-part Applied Remote Sensing Training, SAR for Detecting and Monitoring Floods, Sea Ice, and Subsidence from Groundwater Extraction. My name is Erica Podest, and I'm a research scientist at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, as well as an instructor with the RCEP program. I will be hosting today's training and this entire webinar series. We have guest lecturers that will be presenting each session. And today I will be joined by Dr. Malin Johansson from the Arctic University of Norway. She will be focusing on detecting and monitoring sea ice with SAR. Before we begin our training, I just want to give you a brief introduction to the RSET program. NASA's Applied Remote Sensing Training, or RSET program, is part of the NASA Earth Science Applied Science Capacity Building Program. We provide cost-free trainings on the basics of satellite observations, data processing, analysis methods, and ready-to-use web tools in six thematic areas shown here. Disasters, agriculture, ecological conservation, water resources, climate and resilience, and health and air quality. Our trainings are offered both online and in person, but the majority of our trainings are online. All of our training materials, recordings, and Q&A transcripts are available on our website, so you can register and participate live as you're doing today, or you can review our past trainings in your own time. We also offer a self-paced training on the fundamentals of remote sensing. Our trainings are offered at no cost and usually include a bilingual option, whether that's translated materials or the training itself is delivered in Spanish. And all trainings include only publicly available open source software and data. Our trainings are offered at a variety of levels from introductory to advanced to allow you to learn remote sensing based on your level of experience and need. If you'd like to know more, please visit our website. From there, you can find information about and register for upcoming trainings, view recordings and review material from past trainings. You can also sign up for our listserv to be notified about upcoming training opportunities. To begin, I'll provide an overview of our training before we begin the session. So sea ice, floods, and groundwater extraction can be seen from space. And the objective of this training is for participants to learn how to use SAR data to detect and address these potential disasters related to these sorts of events. Um, and they can all have, all of these events can have a large impact not only on human lives, but on infrastructure and the economy. So SAR can be critical in informing on the ground efforts, um, on disaster mit mitigation efforts and resilience. By the end of this webinar, participants will be able to generate subsidence maps due to groundwater extraction in order to inform risk and resource management detect and monitor sea ice to identify potential risks to shipping and coastal erosion, and detect and monitor floods in order to more closely monitor the increase or decrease of floodwaters and better inform disaster response and management. And here's the list of prerequisites for this training, starting with the fundamentals of remote sensing, followed by an introduction to SAR, uh, specifically the first and fourth, fourth sessions of that webinar series, and then radar remote sensing for land, water, and disaster applications, specifically the second session of that series. Here we can see an outline of the training. It will take place over two weeks and consist of three parts or three sessions. Each session will be two hours long, including a Q&A. Note that 
so today is the first session. The second session is next Tuesday, October 31st, and the third session is on Wednesday, November 1st. Please make a note of that. All presentation slides, recordings, and Q&A transcripts will be available on the training page. There will be one homework assignment, which will open on the date of the final session, which is on Wednesday, November 1st. It will remain open until November 17. A certificate of completion will be awarded to those who attend all live sessions and complete the homework assignment before the due date. Just wanted to remind everyone that if you have a question, please type it into the question box. We will be collecting these questions and answering them at the end of today's training. We will also be compiling these questions and answers into a Q&A document, which will be posted on the training website in about a week. Any questions we do not get a chance to answer live will still be recorded along with our answers. And now I would like to welcome Dr. Malin Johansson from the Arctic University of Norway. It's a great ple pleasure to have her here again. Uh, she was guest lecturer for the previous RSET SAR training where she talked about the use of SAR to detect oil spills. So uh, very pleased that she is with us again to share her vast experience and knowledge and this time for detecting and monitoring sea ice with SAR. Thank you, uh, Dr. Johansson. The floor is yours. Well, uh, thank you. So my name is Malin Johansson and I'm here today to talk with you about a detection and monitoring of sea ice using SAR images. Uh, so here you can see a lovely uh, image in the background of sea ice uh, of uh, various different age and types. And at the end of this lecture, you will know a lot more about what you're looking at right now. So at the end of this session, uh, you should be able to understand the mechanisms uh, behind why we can monitor sea ice, what challenges this monitoring is giving us, and how we can derive CS characteristics using single and dual polarization SAR images. And also how satellites and SAR in particular fit into the larger scale pictures when it comes to safe shipping and climate models. So let's start from the scratch. What is sea ice? Uh, sea ice is ice that forms from uh, the freezing of ocean water. And that means that this ice is very salty. It's ice that we have year round in the Arctic Ocean, it surrounds the Antarctic Peninsula, and it also occurs in subpolar seas, such as those areas indicated here with the red arrows, the Baltic Sea and the Sea of Okutsk. So uh, what does it look like? Well, you saw first a SAR image. Here's what it looks like in, in reality when we're out there. There have many different shapes, forms and thicknesses. So the, one of the earliest stages we have is the NILAS, which you see here on the top left. This forms under calm ocean conditions. And then you also have pancake ice. These are both new ice types. They're reasonably recently formed, but under very different conditions. The NILAS under calm conditions and the pancake ice under more rough conditions. We also have leads here. So you can see a lead that's open up in the thin ice areas where you can see the open water in between. But most people more, maybe think more of the thicker ice types, the ones we see polar bears standing on. And these are the first year ice and multi year ice types. Over here, there's uh, three different pictures of thin first year ice, rough first year ice, and also multi year ice. And here's the sort of basic mechanisms and classes of ice formation. We have the new ice, which is the first ice that forms. It has a high salinity, but it's not very thick. We then go through the stages of young ice towards first year ice and finally old ice. The old ice, they were talking about ice that is more than two meters thick and has survived at least one melt season. And this is also the least uh, salty of the ice types that we have. So what does it look like? We often take cores from the sea ice. So we drill ourselves with a 
looks like a straw through the ice uh, to take samples from it. And you can see such an example on the left here. And you can also, if you look in the from the edge here, you can see that there is quite a lot of uh, pockets or air bubbles. Um, this is where the salt has accumulated in the so-called brine pockets. And over time, the salt drains out of the sea ice and leaves behind cavities, which are then filled with air. And as the sea ice ages, the salinity, density, and the surface roughness uh, changes. And if you look in the diagram on the right, you can see that the top of the sea ice normally is colder. It has more of an air-like temperature, whereas the sea ice at the bottom has a temperature more similar to the uh, open ocean underneath it. And the salinity is as its lowest values at the top and the highest values at the bottom. And all of these changes affects uh, what the radar can see. So here's a close up we see from the side, sliced in a very, very thin sheet. Um, it's the same core, but it's now cut into a small piece. And we can see that the, the crystal structure looks very different. At the top, we have the so-called granular ice, and lower down, you can see more columnar ice. And these uh, vertical or the structure of the crystals affect what the radar can see. So now you know the, uh, how the ice forms and where it's located, but it doesn't um, exist all the time in all areas. And that is because in the summer it starts melting and starts disintegrating. First, the snow on top of the sea ice melts and melt ponds start forming. And you can see such a melt pond here uh, in the ice flow. And this is at the very start of the melt season. So they, you have the melt ponds just sitting on top of the sea ice. And this means also that the albedo is decreasing and the heat absorption in the ocean can start increasing. And over time, these melt ponds grow in size. Some will be penetrating all the way through the sea ice, so connecting the ocean to the ocean from uh, both above and below. And this causes further weakening of the sea ice. And due to interactions with the surrounding ocean, the ice then starts breaking into smaller fragments. But you can also have the um, melt ponds that just reside on top of the sea ice, but they still cause a weakening of the sea ice structure. And these are changes that we can very clearly observe with SAR images. And it's something that we really need to account for when it comes to the monitoring and detection of the sea ice itself. So what does this look like? Well, I've already seen some SAR images. And here is a movie of sea ice that we tracked with sea ice drifters um, in the spring of 2022. And at the start of this video, the sea ice is very cold. We can see a lot of structures. And about now in the images, the temperature has risen so much that the snow starts melting and there's a clear change in the SAR signatures. We have simply gone from the spring and winter into the summer season and now the ice really starts breaking up and uh, turn into very small pieces. So if we just sort of stop the movie and look at two sets of images, we have the freezing conditions on the left and we have the melting conditions on the right. And the first ones here are from the end of April and early May and in 2022. And the last two images are from the end of May and early June 2022. And things look quite different in these images. So, and this is simply caused by the melting. Uh, these images were taken at the same time as we had a campaign where we collected in situ data in this region. So we happen to know that in the images on the right, the temperature has turned positive and we really started having melting. Uh, the melting itself started around 27th, 28th of May and this first image here is from the 31st of May. So when we monitor we really need to account for these kind of changes because the ice itself has not necessarily changed much here but what we can observe in the SAR images has changed quite significantly. And the, how we deal with these kind of changes is something you learn more about in the next hour or so. So you probably all heard that we have the Arctic sea ice and the Antarctic sea ice also is changing. And you probably then heard that it is disappearing. 
So what do we mean with the ice disappearing? Well, we can first here look at the ice thickness. So here on the left is an image from 1985. This is what the conditions were like in March then. And on the right is an image from March in 2022. And the older ice here has been marked with in red, uh, followed then by yellow, green, and the youngest ice is the blue. And you can see that there's a lot less red to the right and more blue. And the red indicates an ice that is more than four years old. But you can also here see that the ice is not equally distributed across the Arctic. The Canadian archipelago, that's where we have the oldest sea ice, and also around when you go towards the Alaskan side. And if you go towards the east, here's where we have the youngest sea ice. So the changes across the ocean uh, varies. And today, a larger fraction of the Arctic sea ice is less than one year old than it used to be. And yeah, you have the oldest and thickest ice in the west and the youngest and thinnest ice in the east. So I talk about here as the age of the sea ice. How do we actually determine the age of the sea ice? Well, this is not something that we do with SAR images, but we start counting from the 1st of September or the start of the freeze-up season. And once the ice has survived one melting season, when we have these melt ponds, then we say that the ice has turned to one year old. And this roughly happens then on the 1st of September. So what do we actually monitor? So this lecture is supposed to be about monitoring and detection of sea ice. Well, we use different parameters. Uh, we often talk about three different things. First one is the sea ice extent. And here you can see an image from quite recently, the 30, 27th of September in 2023. And this is around the time when we say that the sea ice is at its lowest, the sea ice minimum. We also talk about the sea ice concentration and the sea ice type. And on the right here, you can see a sea ice concentration map. We talk about the different types, and I already hinted towards that we have the newer ice and we have the older ice. So that's one thing that we also try and monitor uh, from space. And we also talk about the, the final is the stage of development. Now, these, how we monitor sea ice was not necessarily designed with a radar uh, in mind. A lot of the terminology that we're using, uh, such as the WMO nomenclature, uh, was devised while well, people were standing on the ice and were looking at the ice itself and imagining what it meant to them in a way. And SAR does not see thickness, or to a large degree cannot see thickness. And when we talk about the ice stage of development, we start with the open water and then new ice, nylas, nylas with frost flowers, and so on as the ice thickens. But SAR, on the other hand, sees roughness, uh, surface roughness. So we're talking about millimeter to decimeter range. It sees volume in homogeneities, so air inclusions, these brine pockets that you saw pictures of earlier, the snow grain size, and so on. So when we talk about SAR images, this is what we can see, and we somehow the other needs to relate that back to these ice type that the WMO has established. So yes, the ice uh, vary over the year. We have the seasonal cycle. The ice is lying on top of the ocean. This means that it's drifting. It is not stationary. Uh, we have two areas in the Arctic when the ice is disappearing through. We have the Bering Strait, you can see as a top uh, red triangle or rectangle here. And then we have the Fram Strait, which is the lower rectangle uh, between uh, Greenland and Svalbard. In the Fram Strait, we have the fastest flowing sea ice in the world um, or in the Arctic Ocean. And this is an area that is very challenging then when it comes to sea ice monitoring and detection, because the two SAR images will see very different things, even if they're looking at the same location at different points in time. So that's one of the reasons how the sea ice extent can vary. It can melt, but it can also drift away. So why do we monitor it? One of the first things is that um, it controls the albedo in the Arctic Ocean. When there's no sea ice, 
the solar energy is absorbed by the ocean. And if we start adding sea ice, the albedo changes. We have a higher albedo. And the sea ice reflects then more incoming solar radiation and the ocean temperature can increase less. If we on top of that add snow on the sea ice, the albedo gets even higher and most of the solar radiation is um, simply um, reflected away from the ocean. So this is why we, we are using this also then for climate modeling, but the ice is also something that we are having to deal with uh, if we're having ships or if we're living in the, Ar in the Arctic. The sea ice uh, is a hinder when we are trying to move our ships. And we then need to use SAR images or other satellite images to help our ship routing. Because you can see here, the image on the left, we see an icebreaker and it's actually surrounded by quite thin ice. But if you're looking at the icebreaker on the right, there is quite a lot of deformation there. And these two areas, it's quite different how challenging it is to move through. And generally all ships will try and avoid areas with heavily deformed or very thick sea ice. So um, for the operation of sea ice mapping here, we're looking for optimizing the icebreaker routes or routes for any ship for that matter. We try and go towards the areas that are indicated with uh, green arrows here, which are leads, and we try and avoid the areas that are indicated by red arrows. So the leads are openings, and obviously the ridges are closings where sea ice has drifted towards one another and caused uh, obstacles for us. And yeah, the sea ice moves. So here we can see evolution of SAR images where we simply have divergence and convergence areas where one area may have been very easy to travel through at one point in time, but over time it starts having a convergence and the area becomes impassable for many of the ships. It is also used, the sea ice is also used as roads or simply part of the general infrastructure. Um, and there, they want to know where there's ridges and deformed sea ice areas because they're very challenging to move through and you would look for something that's flatter, which is much easier to traverse. We also want to know where the sea ice is for to monitor the coastal erosion. The sea ice would generally act as a barrier between the coast and the open water. And you can here see sea ice extending out from the coastline in uh, some area in area of Svalbard. And for each day the sea ice sits there, it actually protects the coastline from further erosion. So if we can include um, the presence of sea ice into coastal erosion models, we can actually get a much better estimate of how the coastal erosion is affecting these areas. And last but not least, uh, the important for the climate system. Leads will enable heat and gas exchanges, something the sea ice itself would limit. The frequency and the size of the leads and polynias are therefore essential to have a good grasp of when we calculate the regional heat fluxes and budgets. So you can see here, heat flux from the sea surface is between 100 and 1000 watts per square meter, whereas if you have one meter thick sea ice, it gets reduced to between 5 and 20. So it's a very important parameter to account for when we're doing um, heat and gas exchange uh, estimates. So how do we do it? How do we get from these kind of uh, low altitude images taken from a plane to monitor sea ice? Well, we use SAR images for this and we derive sea ice maps. So how do we actually derive the maps? Well, they are drawn by hand. We use expert knowledge and we use history of sequence from SAR images. We often look at yesterday's image from the past or the last hour in this day. We use information from, provided from ships. We use other satellite sensors as a passive microwave sensors. And we also use weather forecasts to indicate how the ice is likely to have moved from one day to the next. But obviously we have a lot of uh, satellite images being uh, taken every day over the ocean and we are simply no longer able to keep up using all of these images as input into our sea ice maps. 
So there's a lot of um, work ongoing right now to use AI or machine learning techniques to improve the ice charts. Though as of yet, this is still under investigation. And one of the reasons for that is very important to avoid misclassifications regarding hazardous ice conditions. You do not want to send a ship into an area which can be very challenging or even dangerous for them to be in. So yeah, I hope you all know that, well, SAR images, they can penetrate clouds, therefore they can work during the polar night. Uh, something that is very essential when we're going to work with sea ice detection. So because a few months of the year, there is no daylight in these regions. The weather can be cloudy. We have between 17 and 80 percent cloud cover at any point in time. And in summer, you can also add the additional fog. The SAR images are therefore essential if you want to have high resolution, cover large areas and at the same time have year round coverage. But the SAR is not easy to intuitively interpret. And we need to understand how the radar signal interacts with the ground. So here you can see on the right we have some SAR images and on the left we have some optical Sentinel-2 images. For the SAR image we use the force color composite and you can see that it's very easy though to separate the sea ice and the water in the optical image but in the SAR image it's not that easy. Though other things are starting to become apparent such as the ridges. And let's look at some more examples here. I hope you can see the flicks between a Sentinel-1 and a Sentinel-2 image. So you can see here that the SAR image doesn't tell the full story, but neither does the optical one, because in the optical one we can't really see through the snow. And there are areas where we have more ice and less ice and is simply obscured by the presence of snow. And here's another image. You see this slight shift in time, so they're not taken at exactly the same time but you can see a lot more information about where we have deformation in the SAR images than we can in the optical images. So the positive sign is using SAR images as it works at night, it can see through the clouds and it can see roughness, which meant that we can use this to detect deformed sea ice areas. And that is something that is very useful for safe shipping. We have some challenges. Uh, the radar intensity signatures are ambiguous. It's not easy to directly connect the CS properties and there's multiple scattering scales involved. One of the problems we have is, for example, the young ice types. Young ice can be bright due to the presence of frost flowers. These are ice crystal structures that appear on top of the sea ice. And in the radar, these two images that we can see here would look very similar. Uh, this is simply because we have volume scattering from the frost flowers in the image on the lower right and we have a volume scattering from all of the deformation and all these ridges and areas that you can see in the, the upper image. Uh, young eyes has a very large range of SAR signatures. You can see here three pictures of younger ice types and they are all very, very different in the SAR image, though they are perfectly safe for any ship to go through. Um, they have a high salinity, but different deformations and different presence of frost flowers and other things. And if we look here in the SAR signature, so this is the VV channel and the blue crosses here indicate new eyes. And hopefully you can see here that they actually cover more or less the entire spectrum, the entire range here for um, all the different frequencies. We have an X-band, C-band, and an L-band image. And simply the newly formed sea ice, has, it covers it all. And this is something that we need to account for when we're gonna do automatic monitoring of sea ice. The MEL season. I already shown you some images. The melt season changes everything. The separation between wet sea ice, melt ponds on the sea ice and open ocean is very uh, challenging. We're trying to separate also between the open ocean and the sea ice. The open ocean, we can have the wind affecting the areas there. So the backscatter values are wind speed dependent. We also have the propagation and scattering of radar waves in snow and ice layers that cause complex interaction processes. 
It is therefore challenging to come up with one solution that will work year round, be it an AI machine learning based or a manual uh, classification based type. But let's start looking now a bit more on the SAR images themselves. What type of SAR images do we use operationally? We rely primarily on scan SAR images because they have a, a good coverage. Uh, these days we use data with the HH and HV channels. They are provided by the Radarsat Constellation mission. They are provided by the Sentinel-1 data, freely available. Any one of you can start your own uh, CS classification or CS monitoring. Uh, we have good backscatter signatures and over time we have learned how the CIS interacts with the SAR uh, over these uh, CIS areas and CIS types. You can already here see a advantage of having two channels. So at the top we have an HA channel, at the bottom we have the HV channel. The CIS edge is somewhat challenging to see in the HA image, but if we look in the HV we can clearly see the edge between the open water and the CIS. This image here is also taken from the Baltic Sea in an area between Sweden and Finland, and we only here have seasonal ice, so the ice is reasonably easy to, uh, to detect uh, because we don't have the, the challenges with the multi-year ice. And here is an, is an oldie but goodie, it's an ERS-1 SAR image from 1992. Unfortunately or fortunately, the ice has not really changed uh, since then. If we look in the red rectangles here, we can see two different types of uh, level or smooth ice. And if we look in the orange box, we can see more ridges. And these are the kind of things that we are then using this knowledge on how the different ice types look in SAR images when we want to drive uh, monitoring and detection of sea ice. And over time, we have also learned how the backscatter signatures change. So on the left here, you can see a little bit of a reminder on the ice growth process from the frazzled ice or from the calm ocean until we get to ice sheets and uh, thicker ice. But on the right, you can also see the radar scattering coefficient and how it changes uh, over time. As the sea ice thickens and the salinity changes. So we start with having reasonably low backscatter values. They drop once the ice starts forming then the values increase again only to drop down again. So there is um, these kind of changes with ice thickness we need to account for and we can have all of these different ice types at any given point in time in your SAR image. So there is a lot of factors we need to look into when it, of both from how the sea ice affects the SAR image and then how the sensor parameters affect how we can study the sea ice. But let's take it one thing at a time. Let's start first with the CIS properties. The difference in salinity will affect the dielectric constant and the penetration depth. So yeah, the sea ice is salty, it's made up of salt water. It accumulates in these brine pockets and channels. And once the ice has started to form, the brine starts to being expelled from the sea ice. So you have sort of the saline ice you can see in the image here on the left which has a higher salinity and then lower down the salinity actually decreases. There can also be a salt layer at the surface that affects the radar signature due to changes in the dielectric constant. If the brine drains out of the bottom, it leaves behind empty pores enabling volume scattering. And on the right you can also see a first year ice picture where you see these brine cells. So Yes, which brings us to the porosities and inclusions. So yeah, there's another illustration with one more undulating surface where the snow grains in the snow layer brine inclusion of the sea ice here. So we have the brine inclusions and then we have the seawater underneath and depending on the um, size of the snow crystals that will also affect um, the radar backscatter signatures. There, the photo here, the snow grains, there is up to two millimeter in two millimeter lens, and they're approximately uh, 1.2 centimeters big. So they will affect the sea ice uh, scattering. 
we also have the surface roughness and topography. So a bit higher up in the, we've looked in the ice itself, but now we can look at the surface of the ice. And here are some pictures. We can see we have rough ice at the top of the leftmost pictures, and then we have a thinner new ice at the lower, uh, lower left. If we look in the SAR image to the right, there's one channel, the HH, from a fully polarimetric Radarsat 2 images. It contain a few sea ice types. Uh, within the white rectangle here, we have young ice. This ice here was uh, observed during the Mosaic expedition. If you're interested to learn more about the Mosaic expedition, I urge you to uh, just look online. There's a lot of useful information out there. So the ice here we know is rather smooth and it's a slightly less than 30 centimeters thick at this point in time when this image was taken. We have the bright area within the blue circle. This is a ridged area. We have a lot of deformation in this area. And then the very dark uh, area within the purple uh, circle is refrozen melt ponds. And the surface here is very smooth. And finally, then we also have the layers. We have the snow ice interface, we have the sea ice water interface, and we have the snow cover with different densities, grain size, and, and moisture levels. So you can see here also an illustration at the bottom where you talk about the different scattering properties when we have multi year ice, first year ice, and open water. We normally talk about the snow layers as dry snow layers, and then the radar can see through them. Uh, if we here compare an optical image at the top and an Elbensar image at the bottom, the snow is largely impenetrable by the optical sensor, but we can clearly see through it with the radar. So we can see some ridges in the optical image because there's shadows and these kind of features that we are used to uh, looking at, but the ridges are very easy to see in the SAR image. And once the sea ice is thick enough, so the return signal will come from the snow on the sea ice and not from the sea ice and uh, water interface, because you can also see some open water areas where you see some structure in the SAR image as well. Radar operated between L and X band looks through the dry snow, and this is an advantage for many of our applications. But some, we also have other KU bands where it may not do, and we are using that for when we want to derive the ice thickness and so on but that's for another lecture. But the snow is not always dry. So here are some pictures taken from a recent campaign, an outer melt campaign, which was look, um, targeting the melting conditions in the Arctic Ocean. So it was planned to be then between May and June in 2022. A lot of snow is being done and here are some of those images. At the start of the cruise we had very dry snow. You can you can see, you can almost feel how crisp the, the air is this image. Um, on the other hand, if you look towards June, um, the onset of melt had started and the melting had started in the snowpack itself. And you can probably see at the bottom there that the, the ruler here sits in a bit of slushy um, water. And here we simply see um, the effect of the melting, as I showed earlier in the lecture here, between the freezing conditions and the melting conditions, we start seeing the water rather than the snow on, or the ice underneath. And on the right, you can also see two images very close in time, but here um, the indication or the, in, uh, the radar signature changes and indicated the surface has gotten wet. So all of these things we need to consider um, and how the, the sea ice affects the SAR imaging. But of course we have the SAR sensor itself, where we have different polarizations. So I already talked about the fact that we use HH and HV channels. And you can see here the HV channel is really useful to separate open water from sea ice. And this helps us reduce the ambiguities when we interpreted radar signatures in terms of the ice types. The water appears dark and is better separation between the multi-year ice and the first year ice, or the level and deformed ice. And the sensitivity to the incidence angle is less. 
And I will come back to the incidence angle in quite some detail very soon. So what we can see here, we tracked here the same sea ice over time. This is the same image, it's the same movie that I showed earlier. And through the use of drifters, we could ensure that we followed exactly the same sea ice flow over a time period of about uh, two months. Or here, actually, it's uh, just a little bit more than one month. It's a multi-year ice flow, and we're using Sentinel-1 images. And to the left here, you can see we have freezing conditions, and to the right, we have melting conditions. And the blue uh, dots are indicative of the HV backscatter values and the orange one of the HH. So you can see in the freezing conditions, things are pretty stable. We don't have that many changes, but we start seeing an obvious change when we go to the melt season. And we, in this campaign here that we put out drifters, we didn't just put out one drifter, but we put out many drifters and we put them on different ice types. And here we can see multi-year ice, so ice that has survived many uh, melting seasons, and then first-year ice that has survived only one. And you can see that the changes in backscatter varies between these two different ice types. Where for the uh, multi-year ice, the backscatter values gets reduced when the melt season start, and for the first year ice, actually the backscatter values increase. And using these kind of changes in backscatter behavior, we can determine which ice types we're looking at, provided that we follow the same ice over time. But this also then causes obviously challenges for development of automatic CS classifications, because the ice is not looking the same year round. And yeah, I already talked about the incidence angle. The incidence angle is a little bit of a nemesis uh, here because we know the fact that the rate of backscatter is produced with increased incidence angle. This is something new, we've known for a long time. And smooth targets such as the ones that are here have a sharp drop in the rate of return with increased incidence angle. So we need to account for this in any monitoring of the sea ice. So we can, correct it using um, one slope across the entire image. Um, that's one way of doing it, but the ice types do not have the same changes uh, across all the incidence angles. So it's not perfect, but it's a very good way of doing an automatic correction. We could also look at for one correction for each different ice type. But first, you can see on the right here, we have some uh, gray level concurrence parameters with HH contrast, HH energy, and you can see that the, the return values here change quite a lot with change in incidence angle. But the changes across the scene is dependent on the materia. And here you can see an image showing open water and multi ice. And doing one correction for both of these two is good, but it may not tell the entire story. And also you can see here the separation between the two different materia is easiest in this example at an incidence angle range, sort of bit, or most challenging between 30 and 35, which is in the center part of the um, Sentinel-1 images, for example. So we really need to um, get a handle on the incidence angle effects. And here I can just show another example. So the sensitivity is stronger for the smoother surfaces, so the thin ice and the calm open water, than for the rougher and deformed or wind roughened water areas. And here you can see the same uh, floats are indicated within these two red circles, but with slightly different incidence angles. So to the left, we have very high incidence angles, 42 to 45. And to the left, we have very low between 19 and 22. So you can see that these values um, change quite a lot, and any automatic classification needs to account for this and realize that it's the same ice type. We can address this once we know which sea ice type, such as was done here. Uh, if you look on the left, the incidence angle has not been accounted for, and if you look on the right, it has been accounted for. So you can see the importance of 
adjusting for the incidence angle, uh, both over time, but also between different images so that we can see that the changes we're observing is actually a physical change and not a change of the sensor itself. So let's also talk a bit about the resolution and the sense of noise. We have talked about the incidence angle. We have talked about the uh, polarization. Here on the left, we can see an airborne SAR images over sea ice, a pixel size of five meters. And on the right, a satellite SAR image with a pixel size of 12.5 meters. They're taken over the same area at the same time. And as you can see, there are quite a lot of things that you can still identify. Some of the ridges are easy to see and some of the open water areas or thinner ice areas we can observe. But of course, these airborne missions with a very high resolution, they cover a much smaller area. So when we want to do operational ice monitoring, we need to have a balance between coverage and resolution. And here we can also see a image from the Fram Strait. Remember, this is the fastest flowing sea ice drift, uh, and we need to have them very close in time. Here is a time difference of about one hour, which means that things have moved and they're not lying exactly how they were before. But at the top here, we have 150 meter resolution. Um, and at the lower one, we have a two meter resolution. So things are quite different. But we can still observe quite a lot of the flows uh, clearly. And the more deformed sea ice flows have clearly high back and scatter signature in both images. And the level smoother thinner ice is clearly recognizable as the darker areas. And we have used information from such campaigns to help us interpret more what we can see in the satellite SAR images. And frequency. Uh, let's talk about this. It's one of the things that I'm very passionate about. And we also have a lot of new and exciting upcoming missions, such as the NISAR, ALOS-4 and ROSE-L. And we already have existing Elban missions, such as ALOS-2 and SAUCOM. And it's something that is becoming more important to consider um, because the MEL season is lengthening. We have a longer MEL season in both the Antarctic and the Arctic. And we know that the Elban SAR enables easy detection of sea ice ridges and it can account or manage a little bit further into the melt season before it gets very affected by the wetness levels. So why the different frequencies? Well, they have different penetration depth. With x band we have approximately three centimeter wavelength and a very small penetration depth. With Elburn, we have a 23 centimeter wavelength and a much greater penetration depth. Here are two images taken at the same time. I'm hoping everyone is familiar with Pauli images because that's what I'm showing here. And on the left, we have a fully polarimetric Seaman image from Radarsat 2, and on the right, a fully polarimetric image from ALOS 2. The images were taken in early May of 2015, and you can clearly see in the deformed uh, major deformation zones in both images, uh, circled here in the sort of yellowy green color. But there are some differences in the thinner ice areas that is caused by a difference in wavelength. And yeah, CS as we've seen is a, a difficult medium or we have the snow on top and the snow ice interface and then the ice water interface. And depending on the wavelength, the penetration would reach different depths. The X and C band generally scatter from the surface, and the S band can penetrate partially uh, from the surface into the ice volume, and the L band scatter is generally from the ice volume itself. So, because we're looking at different scattering mechanisms here, because of the difference in penetration depth, this can give us added information for sea ice classification. So the penetration depth of different sea ice types can be seen in the image here. I will try to indicate with green lines where you have roughly C band and L band uh, in this graph. And for the L band, we have a higher penetration depth up to one meter. For the C band, we have it in the range of half a meter and for the X band, a maximum of 10 centimeters. And changes in salinity also affects the electric constant, as you can see here. 
So what this means is that the X band shows the largest contrast between first year ice and multi year ice. X band is also more sensitive to the snow on the sea ice, and specifically we start having layers in the uh, snow top layer. Such layers can be wind hardened layers, rain on snow events, uh, with subsequent freezing, warming events, or ice lenses. And changes due to the snowpack means that the X-band is more sensitive to the onset of melt than C and L bands are. And we will particularly exploit the lower sensitivity to onset of melt in L band uh, images. So just to show some more examples here, we have a C-band image on the left and an L-band image on the right, and you can see that they do provide complementary information to one another. Though the incidence angle for those who've already spotted it is slightly different, so it's not an entirely fair comparison here. But again, remember the ice drift in the Fram Strait is, is fast, and here we have a short time separation. Least. But you can see that the open water areas, the thin ice areas, appear very dark in the L-band image and has a lot more texture to it in the C-band image. Um, so in A here we have zones of new ice information, much larger signature variation in the C-band. We have some B, uh, value B here at the top that indicates older ice flows, and you can clearly see this in the C-band images. And then the number C here is brash ice and moderately sized flows of level ice. And you can see here the intensity contrast is, is quite large in the L-band image. And then in D, we also have some shear zones, deformation zones, which is easy to observe in the L-band images. So what do we do? Well, there is a lot of work ongoing now to combine the two frequencies. L-band and C-band has been shown now a number of times to improve the classification accuracy. And first here at the top here, you can see in C-band and an L-band image, they have been drift corrected, so they're completely aligned with one another. And we first have results if we train a CS classifier using just the um, C-band uh, data. Um, and here, if we use the Elban data, and here finally, if we combine the C and Elban data. And hopefully, you can see here that the young ice areas we indicated in purple, we can, by combining the two frequencies, we can much better uh, identify these areas. They're particularly shown here in the blue and the yellow triangles. We can see much better results by combining C and L. The formed areas in the red uh, tri rectangle, we can also see quite well that the combination of the two uh, is superior. And if we can look here at another example, so different images, um, but we can see that the L-band is generally much better at detecting the deformed ice areas or the combination of the two. And at no point in time, uh, is the L-band completely superior? The combination of the, the two of them is equally good or better. And if we're looking at only the combination of C and L-band can fully capture the young ice in the open water within lead systems correctly. So yeah, how do we do this? Well, we go from the images or the information we've learned about how the SAR interacts with uh, the sea ice that we can observe from planes or from in situ campaigns. We account for the snow and we use this information that we've learned and take that towards the SAR images where we can then identify ridges, young ice and refrozen melt ponds. And over time, we take a whole range of all the available SAR images within reason and we use them to produce these sea ice map. And reason for wanting to do so is that we now have SAR systems have been up and running for such a long time now that we can drive a long time series of the CS extent and the cover in specific areas such as shown here. This is from Kungsfjord and Svalbard. But now the records goes back to the early 1990s and we can actually see how the season has length has shortened or increased and how the ice when it forms how stable it is. And we use this to monitor and detect global changes. 
So such as looking at the Arctic sea ice yearly minimum. So from the lecture today, I hope you now learn that we can observe surf surface roughness with SAR images and the sea ice takes many forms. So we need to account for the different roughness scales and how they relate to the sea ice itself. We need to look at sensor specifics such as the incidence angle and frequency and how they affect the detection and monitoring capabilities. The great news is the SAR can be used to detect and monitor sea ice. When we can have more than one channel, um, that is great because, the, for example, the HV channel provides better separation between open water and sea ice. We can, for most part, not derive ice thickness using SAR, which makes using the WMO uh, classes challenging, but we can identify areas with different deformation. The young and the thin ice is the most challenging ice type. They can look both like smooth open water and heavily deformed multi air ice in the SAR images. But we have learned how to account for this over time, and we can now also use long time series in climate models. So now that you have seen how the different uh, sea ice types um, can affect the radar backscatter, you're now ready to perform your own sea ice classification. Ideally, we would like to use overlapping SAR and optical images, and many images at that. But today we'll work on one image. So I picked one that contains both fast ice as well as drifting sea ice. Uh, and you can see the name here and it should also be made available to you. The area is in the Belieka Bank area and an area where we have a lot of Sentinel-1 images available as well as from the Extreme Earth project. There's a data set that you can use for training your own sea ice classification. This also happened to be an area we visited during a cruise in April, May 2022 where we did perform CS classification validation. So we know quite a lot of the different ice types that we're gonna be looking at today. So how to go about it? You need to start first open the file in SNAP and we're gonna do the standard pre-processing steps. Doing the calibration, the thermal noise removal, and there are many different ways of doing this and you can search for Sentinel-1 thermal noise removal if you want to know more about this. Uh, you can also do a filtering step or a multi-looking step. For now I'll stick with the 40 by 40 meter pixels that we have from the EW mode. So first the thermal noise uh, removal and then the calibration of the images. And once you've done that you should get an image that looks something like this. In order to speed up the process a bit, we're going to do a bit of a subsetting. So I have proposed here an area that you can cut out. Um, this removes the fast ice area, which is a little bit challenging uh, for any CS classification as well. So we now have an image that we can classify. And today we'll do a random forest classification. And I've decided we're going to do some training data for this. Uh, deformed ice, level ice, young ice, and open water. And the training data is generated by identifying polygons containing the different ice types. So you need to first do a new vector data container and then start doing your um, areas. So here I'm going to provide a little bit of help. So I first looked into the deformed ice areas, and you can see on the left we have the HH channel. And on the right, uh, we have the HV channel. And you need to now derive a number of RUIs. And you should remember by now that the incidence angle effect is important to consider. So you shouldn't just collect RUIs within one small range, but you need to spread them out a bit. So here I identified some deformed ice areas and also some level ice areas. And furthermore, I then continue to do some young ice, pink areas here and some open water areas. Part of the reason we know they're open water areas is also we looked at a time series of Sentinel-1 images over this area and we can see that the ice there has moved so we, we know that the area where we now have open water did not have uh, any or the ice moved away from there uh, in the last day. You can then set up your random forest so you do a classification, supervised classification, and then random forest classifier. You find the folder image with your training data, 
and you then select the classes that you like to include. And for the image and classes that I selected, my results turn out like this. I also now pointed towards where we actually were with the ship uh, within this image, an area that here has been classified as open water because it's very flat area. So the classification is not here perfect and it's something that we need to continue working on. But for now, this is to show you how you can do your own CS classification map using a random forest classification. So I hope you enjoyed uh, this lesson here. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge uh, a big thank you to all the people who helped um, with setting up this class, this lecture, Wolfgang Dijk and Johannes Lohse, Katrin Thälmann, Dennis Demchev, Truls Carlsen and Tobin Eltoff. They provided both slides and input and helpful feedback. And I also like to acknowledge all of those who target order satellite data to overlap with the sea to data campaigns. Um, without the temporal spatial overlaps, a lot of the work that we're doing now would not be, have been possible. And of course, those who participate in the field work collecting the in situ data. And should you have any questions, you can contact me. Here's my contact details. And I also urge you to look at the RSTED website for other um, lectures and the sister uh, programs as well. So also some resources for the latest about the Arctic and Antarctic sea ice. So today I've only talked about Arctic sea ice. There's a lot to be said also by the Antarctic sea ice. And you can look at some extreme earth data set that will provide training data for your own sea ice classification. If you want to know more about the cruise that I mentioned a number of times today, you can also see our cruise report a lot of good references that you can look at and for now thank you and let's start with the questioning thank you dr johansson for that wonderful presentation we've been receiving lots of questions and we are ready to start our live q a Wonderful. So we've been assembling the questions that you've been uh, sending on a Google Doc, and we will be sharing that Google Doc here with you shortly. Um, I'd like to um, note that, as, you, as you've noticed, this is a new platform that we're testing, uh, WebEx. And so for those of you that have attended, have attended RSET trainings, uh, it's a little different. Uh, here, uh, we ask that people post their questions in the Q&A window. So if you go to the bottom right, there are three dots. And if you put your cursor over those three dots, you'll have a menu that opens up with three options, Q&A, notes, and captions. So if you select Q&A, that will open the window where you can write your questions. Uh, I noticed that some of you have also been writing questions in the chat box, so we've been collecting those as well. Um, so, uh, Dr. Johansson is here online, and I will start reading the questions, and she will um, uh, respond. Uh, all right, so the first question, what are we looking for between freezing and melting? Are we talking about change detection? Go ahead, Dr. Johansson. Uh, hello, I hope you can hear me well. Yes, loud and clear. Thank yeah, you. That's, that's good. Uh, so, I guess, well, when it comes to sea ice, it has a seasonal cycle, as I hopefully covered quite quite well in the lecture. Um, and we have the freezing starting in September and then melting somewhere between April and June. This depends a little bit on where in the world you're located. Um, also for the Arctic here. Um, and once the melting starts, we start first having the melting of the snowpack, and then we have the melting of the sea ice. And then we start seeing changes in the in the radar uh, backscatter signatures. So if we're talking about stationary ice, we do actually use change detection methods to detect when the melting starts. Uh, so yeah, we can do change detection there. Um, if we are in areas such as the European side of the Arctic, our ice is drifting uh, very fast. And then we're not really talking about change detection per se, because we have between two images, we're simply not seeing the same ice uh, in them. 
But of course, when the melting stars, we're seeing a change in the backscatter signature. So I hope that sort of answered the question. Great, thank you. Let's move on then to question number two. If we use L band SAR, can we can we estimate the thickness of CIs using coherence and phase values as L band has a higher penetration depth or maybe a band uh, with a higher even higher penetration? Uh, yes, we can to some degree estimate the CIs thickness using L band images. There is though a limit, so above half a meter, uh, we simply cannot, the, the signature is from only from within the ice itself. We no longer have a, a change because we have a reflection between the ice water interface. So up to about half a meter, we can, uh, with Elban, or has been shown um, already 20 years ago with some um, Japanese colleagues, um, Wakabayashi, so I put a link here to a paper. I'm not sure if it's open access, um, but there we, uh, the simplest method here is simply to use the VV and HH ratio, backscatter ratio. So that obviously, um, for those of you who paid attention with the scanser data that we have, which we have often in the HHHV, we cannot use this uh, ratio because we're simply lacking the VV channel. But it is possible, um, and the best results has been achieved with the VVHH. Great. Question number three, how helpful are optical satellites in detecting sea ice? I'm assuming there will not be a great cloud problem near the poles. Uh, yeah, no, optical images are great. There is a lot of applications where we would love to use them. Um, but yeah, clouds and fog. Uh, and here we're talking about the Arctic. So we have a number of months of the year where we simply don't have any daylight. So closer to the poles, it's less of a problem than in the marginal ice zone, either where the sort of the ice zone ends. Uh, but it is more of a problem in the summer months because we have the temperature difference between the when, between the water and the air. So um, we're looking at about a cloud cover of still 70 to 80 percent. Um, the optical images are useful, but once we have snow on top of the sea ice, we start not being, uh, it's not as easy to separate the different ice types. Uh, it can be a challenge to see ridges and deformation if we don't have any shadows. Um, but optical images are excellent for separating open water and sea ice. So they are helpful. And when we want to train um, machine learning methods, AI or other, other things, we often look for overlaps between SAR and, and optical images, simply to have a better uh, classification and more confidence in our labeling. Okay, question number four starts out with a statement, ice is not getting older, the defro defrosting times are shorter, which means there's less ice formation, which means there's less albedo or lower albedo, which causes more local warming, which then leads to less ice formation and even lower albedo. The question here is, has anyone tried albedo change comparison for predictive purposes? Right, so I'm more of a SAR sea ice expert and we cannot do a albedo from, from SAR really. But there has been some uh, quite recent work on albedo retrieval where it's been used to, to look into such things as how um, the change in albedo will affect biological productivity. So I provided here some links to, to uh, open access um, publications where they look simply, yeah, albedo retrieval. And also from a little bit of commercial for this very large drift campaign that we had in 2019 and 2020 uh, from the Mosaic sea ice campaign, where they also looked at the Arctic sea ice uh, albedo. Okay. Question number five, what sea ice properties are more easily classified by changing the polar polarization? Right, yeah, so sea ice properties. Well, um, 
the HV channel is very useful if we're looking at ridges or like this really rough and deformed CIS area. So we talk about ridges and rubble fields and these things. Um, the polarization then changes with the interaction with the surface. So they are very useful for these deformed ice areas. As I said before, the two core polarization channels, they're very useful for the thinner ice areas. Um, the ratio there is often something that we use to simply identify where the thinner ice areas are. Um, we also use the HV channel to separate sea ice from the open water. Um, the open water is one of the arch nemesis that we have for automatic sea ice classification simply because the open water can have so many SAR signatures. It can have very high backscatter, it can have very low backscatter. So we often struggle to separate it from the deformed ice areas and also from the new ice areas. So the HV channel is it's not the ice properties itself that we're using it for, but it is we're using it to separate the open water from the other areas. Okay, question number six. What scene sizes are used or did you use for this type of application? So, for example, the Scansar scenes, what sizes are they? And what resolution are these images typically? Yeah, so we operationally we rely on the Scansar images for any detection and monitoring of, of sea ice. And we do that because of the large aerial coverage. So here we're talking about swath width somewhere between, well, three and 500 kilometers. These days there are some even wider uh, scan source coming up soon. But we are then having a, a pixel size of typically 40 to 50 meter resolution. So when you're looking at the, the actual resolution is about somewhere between 80 and 100 meters. Okay, along those lines, what uh, or how did you calculate the backscatter of each single point in the curve? Uh, and does the point represent the average of an area? Yeah, so I, I tried to go back and see which uh, particular uh, slide this was, but uh, I suspect it's the one where we had the change in backscatter values uh, over time. So we at that particular area, we placed our drifters on the sea ice, and therefore we follow the same ice flows uh, over time. We also looked at other recently identifiable areas in the vicinity of this. So we then managed to extract a number of RUIs from each of the images. But each point there represent the average backscatter within that RUI, so normally one ice flow. And then we use that same ice flow and average the same area of the ice flow for each of the different points. So I'm pointing that towards a um, poster, which has a little bit more details on this. Okay. And uh, just to clarify for those that might not be so familiar with the terminology, uh, the ROI is a region of interest. Yes. So an, an area where we basically had made a little um yeah a line or made a circle over the specific area and then we take all the um values within that circle and make an average of that excellent thank you the next question number eight what is the reason for very for the variations in c band comparing comparing it to l band yeah so i mean here the difference in wavelength is the um, is the big thing here because it has means that we have different radar penetration depth. So in the C-band images, we are primarily seeing backscatter signatures that relates to the surface roughness of the sea ice. Uh, and in the winter, we say that the snow is generally a dry snow. Um, the radar penetrates through, so we're seeing the sort of snow ice uh, interface. The elbow with this longer penetration depth, there we're seeing interaction within or between the radar and the sea ice itself. So we're looking at the porosity and these things in the sea ice. Um, so that's one of the, the two big changes. So the C band is the snow ice interface and the L band is within the ice itself. 
we also have different levels of deformation at the surface of the sea ice, where the C-band will be more sensitive to uh, the small scale roughness, whereas the L-band will be sensitive to slightly larger scale roughness, where the difference between the 5 and the 26 centimeters is what's coming into play here. Okay, question number nine, and this one asks, does the combination of L and C band support flood detection as well? I'll, I'll just start out by adding that uh, this is probably going to be addressed in the third web, uh, third session of this webinar series. Uh, so that'll be the presentation on using SAR for detecting and monitoring floods on Wednesday, November 1st by Dr. Franz Meyer. But uh, if you'd like to add anything else to this, uh, Dr. No, uh, I'm very confident that France will be able to answer this very well, much better than I can. Okay. All right. Then let's move on to question number 10. Do we need to calibrate sigma naught before doing the alignment? Right. So here, well, the images I've been showing has been aligned. And that is if you want to actually compare the different data yeah you want to have them calibrated and you know in as good state as possible so yeah ideally they should definitely be aligned uh, or uh, calibrated before we align them uh, i also point to some quite recent work here between uh, where they aligned l and c band data for drifting sea ice so you're really taking this to the sort of next level where uh, we're trying to align something that can move um, with a number of kilometers per hour if we're unlucky Okay, question number 11 says, I only have a PDF in my image file. Did I download it correct incorrectly? Oh, I guess we need to look at that, but it shouldn't is all I can say for, for now, but maybe we can look at that uh, after the lecture to see that the right data is, uh, is there. Yeah, absolutely. We'll, we'll verify that and uh, shortly yeah. after the end of the session, we'll verify and um, ensure that people uh, have access to the right file. Question 12, can graphs be used to monitor trends and changes in sea ice? Oh, I'm not the right person to answer this question, I don't think. Sure, so we can get back to that question. Yeah. Um, so this, by the way, this uh, document will be posted online within the next few days, so we'll clean it up and we will be addressing all questions. So question number 13, can you please elaborate more on the multi-frequency approach? Right, so um, that is something that is quite new in the sense that now we have a lot of available data the addition of sentinel one being freely available since 2015 means that we have a lot of uh, semen data available and more elban data is becoming uh, available now as we speak yux is making most of the alos 2 scans of data freely available and there has also been a number of uh, collaborative efforts between the different um, space agencies in providing data that is acquired over the same area at roughly the same time so that we can have images that are in both C and L band. And obviously for the Antarctic, NISAR will be a, a game changer in having more L band data uh, there as well. So what we know is with the different penetration depths, we retrieve different information uh, from the sea ice. And with that, we, we can use the differences in the responses in the L and the C band to get more um, certain of the sea ice types that we are looking at. So we know that the L band is more sensitive to the younger ice types. Um, and we can see the changes in some of the younger ice types occurring earlier in the C band and it does an L band. And this can give us a, some indication on the ice growth rate. We have um, known for quite a long time now that the L band is much more sensitive to the roughness and deformation. So the ridges and these things that are challenging for us for the shipping. And then by combining the 
the L and the C band, we can then have more information about the uh, deformation areas. Both the uh, L and the C band have different, or well, they have different sensitivities to the onset of melting. So the L band is a bit slower in the take up when the snow and the ice starts melting. So we then have a, we keep sort of the winter conditions in the L band for a little bit longer. But once we get to the advanced melt season, where we have the melt ponds and we have basically a completely saturated snowpack, the separation between the different ice types is much more uh, obvious in the C band data. So by combining them, we get a much more confident and reliable sea ice um, mapping uh, year round. Okay, question number 14. This participant asks if this is SAR interferometry or SAR polarimetry. Oh, relating to what in the lecture? <laughs> um, I did not cover interferometry, so I guess that will should answer. There is um, also some work done on SAR interferometry of sea ice to detect ridges, uh, which has been uh, quite successful, but I did not. Um, take the time to include that in today's lecture. So when I've been talking about, I have been talking about the polarimetry uh, rather than the interferometry. Okay, great. Uh, question number 15, is it possible to use these methods to monitor rivers? Yeah, if you're talking about uh, sea ice on rivers, yes, it is. There has been quite some great work done by Torsten Gelsetzer uh, recently about um, looking at uh, rivers, uh, river ice. Uh, it's freshwater ice, so it's a little bit different. We don't have the same pores and the same um, SAR signatures related because we're simply missing that, uh, that salinity. But yeah, it's definitely possible. Okay, the next question. It's a great question, actually. I see that HV is a great polarization for detecting sea ice. Can you explain why that is? I've seen a lot of publications using VV for detecting oil slicks on the ocean, which I imagine would be similar to grease ice. Yeah. Is there a difference between these applications for HV versus VV, or is there an opportunity to further leverage VV for sea ice detection? Oh, <laughs> so the, the HV is a great polarization for sea ice. That is correct. Um, obviously, the, the cross polarization channels, we have some, some issues if we have very low backscatter areas, such as um, for oil slicks and also for grease size. So grease size is one of those oil spill lookalikes where, <laughs> um, where we cannot actually easily separate grease size and oil. Um, we can often not use the HV simply because of the signal to noise ratio is it's too low. Um, I believe there will be quite a lot of VV data using NISAR over the Antarctic sea ice areas. Um, by tradition, when we do uh, this operational monitoring, we want to have a consistency in the data acquisition. So boring acquisitions, that as I heard it mentioned, where we don't change things from, from time to time. So a decision was made quite a while back that we often do the HH and HV, and this means that we know quite well um, what the SAR signatures should roughly be for these uh, uh, frequency bands, or sorry, for the, these channels. Okay, question number 17. <laughs> Is the thermal noise removal in SMAP a simple subtraction of the noise equivalent sigma zero, or does it use the Nansen Center algorithm? It does not use the Nansen Center algorithm. It's a yeah, a simple subtraction of the noise equivalent sigma zero with some adjustments, but it is not the Nansen Center algorithm. That is another, I mean, that is easy to implement and you can go to the to the GitHub laboratory and you can get the Nansen Center algorithm, but that is not the one that is inbuilt in SNAP. 
Okay, and uh, along the lines of SNAP, then how the next question, number 18, how do you decide which SNAP pre-processing steps are necessary to undertake when looking at CIs? Um, well, I guess here, building on the shoulders of giants, as the uh, saying goes, um, this has been developed over many years by many great scientists. So that's, um, we have, a, I would say, established a, some um, steps that are necessary to get data into the um, good quality. There are some people who use a terrain correction as well. Not everyone does. So that's a little bit of a debatable, but um, yeah, what I tried to include um, in this exercise here were the sort of the standard ones that most of us make use of. Question 19, going back to the use of uh, different frequencies, can <laughs> you speak, speak to the use of KU band, if any, in your research and airborne sensor utilization versus satellite data? Um, so the KU bands is more related to the snow um, pack. So it is um, definitely uh, useful. And it's used towards altimetry and, and these other applications, but it's not yet used so much for, for SAR applications. So, but I urge you to look, there is a lot of great uh, science being put out now about the utilization of KU band. Um, I can, we can provide some links uh, after the, after the chat. Yeah, and I'd like to add to that. Uh, back when I did my PhD, part of it was using KU band, actually uh, KU band from QuickScat, to look at the onset of snow melt. So yeah. the change in dielectric and snow will cause a large change in the uh, the backscatter. Yeah. Question and and there are many references, and we can include those here. Uh, yes. Question number twenty. How do multi-frequency approaches work given that CIs moves between images? Can a unified time series of multi-frequency images be created using bandpass adjustments similar to the harmonized Landsat Sentinel data set? Oh, I'm not so familiar with the harmonized Landsat Sentinel data set to answer that side of it. Uh, but yeah, no, this is one of the large challenges we have is that the ice moves um, so we have to adjust the uh, images. Um, we use one as the the master file, and then we have to adjust the other one as if it was taken at the same time. I pointed towards uh, work by Denis Demchev earlier, who has done some work in now how to align the the data set. There's also been quite some work done in Canada on this. So we provide some some links to it, but certainly the the movement of the eyes. Um, is um, a big problem and something that we need to address at all times. That's also one of the reasons why um, the a project called the LC uh, project it was uh, is a collaboration between ESA and JAXA, where they try and acquire data on the same days of the same locations. It still provides um, a time separation because the L band images are taken later in the day than the C band images. So this is ALOS two and Sentinel one I'm talking about. But at least having them with a few hours time separation rather than days makes our lives a lot uh, easier. Okay, question number 21. Is there a way to track the Python code used for analysis from the SNAP desktop uh, so that we could use these same methods inside cloud computing formats? And furthermore, allowing us to train models based off of recent classifications we built in SNAP. Oh, I do not know the answer to this question. I uh, SNAP is generally a little bit of a black box in this. I'm not sure it's possible to track the Python code here. We can look into that and yeah, and um, and add further information here to this answer. Question 22, is updated satellite imagery accessible free of charge? And if yes, can we have a link? Um, 
Yeah, I mean, uh, when it comes to Sentinel one, yeah, it's uh, uploaded within a few hours at the most. Um, so yeah, the, with the, we should be able to provide links to ESA and I guess, well, NYSER is not up yet, but um, we will provide links to those that are freely available right now. Um, yeah, and as a heads up, um, the presentation on Friday by Dr. Franz Meyer, he'll be talking about floods, uh, using SAR to detect and monitor floods, and he'll also be showing some of the tools on the Alaska Satellite Facility and uh, different SAR data sets that can be accessed through the Alaska Satellite Facility. Okay, so let's move on to question number 23. How can SAR images be used for permafrost studies and monitoring? Which frequency is optimum for it? And what polarization bands are used for? What time period does one need to consider? And can the current commercial satellites like ISI, CapellaSAR be useful for it? So this is a multi-part question. <laughs> yes, and uh, covers a few other. Um... We will provide some links to works by others who does use our images for permafrost monitoring. Um, after the Q and A here, uh, L band frequency is generally one of the preferred uh, frequencies, um, and I believe that they are using the VV band. But again, I'm gonna look this up. Um, we obviously, when it comes to the permafrost, the, the time period of most importance is when the permafrost starts uh, melting. And then also having a reference in winter when it's not melting. Um, the current commercial satellites uh, are quite useful for these things. They also cover, some of them have a very high repetition frequency and others they provide data at the same time as we have optical sensors as well. So. The, um, the commercial satellites are certainly uh, providing quite a lot of useful um, data for these applications. Okay, question number 24. Can, uh, uh, sorry, I think, so that's been repeated. Uh, uh, question 25, what have you found are the largest challenges to using SAR data? It seems like there are, is a lot to consider when using SAR. Uh, yeah, certainly there there is a lot to consider. Um, so the biggest, as I'm just now going to talk about sea ice, so the biggest challenges we have there is the separation of multi ice from young ice, and also separating of open water from um, all the different ice types. This is a challenge we've been battling for, for many years already, uh, simply because the high backscatter that we get from some of the young ice types, it looks very similar to those of the multi-year ice. So we run the risk of telling ships that we have an area where we have a lot of deformation when in fact we only have five centimeters of sea ice. So this is one of the largest uh, challenges for the for the ice classification when using SAR images. But yeah, I mean, I, I was bringing up all the challenges that we need to consider. Um, and for a lot of these challenges, if we know what they are as humans, and also we can train our algorithms um, to account for them. So like if we see something that we don't we are sort of wondering, is this actually true? If we know what kind of challenges the SAR images are having, we can then make a decision that, okay, yeah, this was a challenging uh, image that we were looking at, but I actually trust my result because uh, of the knowledge that we have of the SAR image itself, if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, great, thank you. Um, before we move on to the next question, there was a, um, I want to address uh, one of the previous questions about um, SNAP, uh, the tracking Python code from the SNAP desktop, and someone, a uh, participant, typed that 
there is a Python API for pro accessing SNAP tools, and the best way is to install SNAP and configure the Python accessibility during the install process. So we'll add this information to that answer. Um, all right, so let's move on then to the next question, which is a very interesting one. Number 26, do changes in salinity values in the Arctic Ocean from melting of freshwater glaciers on Greenland affect the spectral, I, I guess, spectral and backscatter signatures of sea ice? Well, yeah, so if you have some of these areas where you simply have a freshwater layer, you are, in fact, then freezing freshwater rather than freezing um, salt water. So, yeah, then you have the similar situation as when you have the, the rivers that we talked in one earlier question, is that you have a freshwater uh, ice layer. Okay, question 27. Question 27 says, I'm interested in knowing ways to solve the incidence angle effect. And it's usually not clear in the literature and in the community. Usually it refers to scansar images and some people even believe the calibration step in SNAP deals with it. Which procedures do you recommend to eliminate the incidence angle? And do we have to apply them to different types of images um, such as Scansar and strip map, especially for strip strip map in a single SAR image, maybe we don't apply the incidence angle uh, correction. However, do we need to have in keep in mind? Um, do we need to have in mind, for example, normalizing to a specific angle? Okay, so so the bottom line here is, uh, do we need to correct for incidence angle effect depending on the type of image? Uh, I would argue that we do need to account for it. Um, some people will then calibrate instead of using sigma naught, using beta or gamma as a, a simple way of adjusting for the incidence angle effect. The calibration step in SNAP does not deal with the incidence angle effect. Uh, so I think I pointed towards some work by uh, Malik Mahmoud over sea ice where he then defined an incidence angle uh, effect or a kind of what he is using then to adjust the entire scene. There is also some work um, by Park in the cryosphere. We put provide the links um, soon, where they also used a single or one value across the scene. Um, that's the simplest way of doing it. We say, okay, we know something about the incidence angle effect, and we're going to apply a um, a one slope fixing it all um, approach. Um, yeah, we definitely need to apply them to scanser images. I think I'm hoping I've proven to you that the, the effect is there and we need to deal with it one way or the other. Um, the strip map images, we have less of an effect simply because we have less of an incidence angle um, degree range um, in these images. Um, but you need to account for, especially if you would compare, for example, two strip map images over the same area, but has different incidence angles. Like, how do you compare a value of minus 25 in one image? And you say the next image is minus 35 decibels. Is that because of different incidence angle? Is that an actual effect? So, especially if we're looking at time series, we, we really need to account for it so that we are comparing apples and apples. Okay, question number eight, 28. You mesh, mentioned an advantage of combining SAR scenes with different bands. Are there any plans to design a satellite with multiple or different SAR bands? I think that's everyone, every radar remote sensing uh, scientist's dream, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, and NYSAR will have LNS band, of course. So there we have two two SAR bands that will be acquired near nearly simultaneously. But yeah, there is um so yeah. Yes, and looking forward to NISAR, which uh it will be launched uh the beginning of 2024. So that's gonna be a great data set. Yes. 
Question 29. SAR is said to be transparent to dry snow. However, there are studies from the sea ice and glaciology community on this. How useful is the use of SAR for snow thickness? And I will appreciate some references if possible. Um, so the KU band that was raised as an earlier question, there we can start talking about the snow thickness. It's not necessarily that easy with um, the XC and L band images that we have primarily uh, talked about today. But um, yeah, we will provide some some references and yeah, we are always talking about saying that the SAR is transparent to dry snow, but I think more and more evidence is showing that that is not entirely true. We're also starting to have more of rain on snow events in the winter in the Arctic. And that means that we are actually, the snow is not dry anymore. We cannot say that just because we're in the freezing season, we're having a dry snowpack. And also when we get to the marginal ice zone, we have a lot of waves that splash up on the, on the ice itself. So there the snow also isn't dry. Uh, but we'll certainly provide some some references to to this. Okay, question thirty. Is there a possibility to use SAR to detect surface water pollution? Um, well, I guess we'll uh, refer to the oil spill lecture from from last year, um, and I'm sure there's some other. Um, earlier uh, NASA set lectures as well on surface water pollution? Yes, absolutely. Um, those are uh, using optical data and we can include those links here. Question 31. Does the ionosphere or rainfall play a role in pulse retrieval in SAR images? Is that something taken into account in the quality control band? And if it is, is it a reliable indicator of the quality of the pixel? Um, yeah, certainly the ionosphere is playing um, a role in the in the quality of the SAR images, uh, particularly when we get to, to L-band. There, <clears throat> for most of the, I think NASA and ESA and JAXA and the other um, satellite service data providers, they do uh, quality control checks um, on this. But there is generally a little bit of ionospheric effects remaining at at times. It's less of a problem in the in the X and the C band. Wonderful. So that marks the end of our questions. Unless there's anything else coming in right now. No, that that was it. So well. Uh, and it marks the end of this uh, first session. I, I would like to thank the RSET team um, for all their efforts in making this possible. Selwyn Hudson Odoi, Brock, ben, Brock Blevins, Natasha Johnson Griffin, Sarah Kutschall, Sean McCartney, Jonathan O'Brien. And I would like to thank all participants and remind them that the recording for today's uh, session will be online in the next couple of hours. I believe the presentation is already online. Um, and finally, I uh, remind you that the next session, which is on detecting subsidence due to groundwater extraction using interferometric synthetic aperture radar, will be next Tuesday, October 31st. And it will be a lecture by Dr. Eric Fielding from JPL um, at the same time. I would I'd like to especially thank our guest lecturer uh, today, Dr. Malene Johansson, for a really great presentation and again for being so generous with her time and sharing her knowledge and experience. So before I close, Dr. Johansson, would you like to say any final words? No, I'm just uh, happy to receive all of these uh, very uh, interesting questions as well. It's it's great to have such knowledgeable audience. Absolutely. So with that, then we will see or hear each other uh, next Tuesday. Wishing everyone a great day and um, uh, keep uh, tuned for the uh, Q&A transcript and the recording. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.